It's a pleasure to be welcoming you to our third virtual State of Democracy lecture for the year with Gretchen Soren. I'm Grant Reher, director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, which coordinates the series. On behalf of Syracuse University, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Let me just take a minute to remind you that if you missed some of our earlier events, you can find video recordings of them on the Campbell Institute webpage under the events tab. And that in two weeks time, we'll have our fourth and final State of Democracy lecture when Professor Ruth ben Giat from New York University comes to speak to us about her new book, Strong Men, From Mussolini to the Present. But before I offer a very brief introduction of today's speaker, Gretchen Soren, I wanna issue some heartfelt thanks. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for zooming in for this. I wanna thank the Maxwell Dean's office for supporting the series, especially during these difficult times, and the Dean, David Van Slyke. For technical support, the Information and Computing Technology Group, and in particular, the wizard, Tom Fazio. Thanks as well to Kelly Coleman, Jackie Nachevsky, and Zane Aga, who work in the Campbell Institute and help put together these events. And a special shout out to Jackie Nochevsky, who's celebrating her birthday today. If we were all here in person, I would ask us all to serenade her with happy birthday, but I will spare her that embarrassment um, since we are virtual. Regarding our format, well, first we'll, we'll hear from Professor Soren and she'll have control of the screen during that time in order to share some visuals with us. And then we'll move to your questions. You should be seeing a little Q&A icon at the bottom of your page, and you can type in your questions there. I'll be keeping an eye on them as we go, and a couple others are watching too, and will communicate your questions to me. Now, normally this is also the time when I would alert you to the reception that we would host following the event, but instead with a virtual event, I will just invite you to treat yourself to a drink and a snack when the event is over. So let me now briefly introduce our speaker, Gretchen Soren. I had desperately wanted to be able to bring her to campus in person in order to meet directly with our students. And in fact, we postponed this talk once in that hope, but I don't think we should wait any longer to hear about this important topic. So here she is with us today virtually. Gretchen Soren is a woman of many talents. She's been a museum exhibitor, educator, director, and consultant. She teaches courses on African-American art. Currently, she is director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program and a distinguished professor at SUNY Oneonta. As director, she has been keen to build out a focus in museum studies on cultural literacy, social justice, and audience engagement. And she is also, of course, a writer and a documentary producer, which brings us to Driving While Black, Amer African-American travel and the road to civil rights. Regarding her book, uh, when I was reading it, I had that rare and valued experience of seeing something previously thought familiar in a completely new light and through a new lens. And her book, African American Auto Travel, and really the automobile itself, emerge as a path toward greater freedom, not just in a physical sense, but also in a cultural and subjective sense. The car provided a limited but real release from state-sponsored and state-enforced racial segregation and degradation. And it also provided a vehicle through which white people in America could experience African-Americans in a different way and in a different context. Now, of course, automobile journeys still had to happen in the world as it was, and those journeys therefore introduced new threats and new dangers. So, for all these reasons, travel itself really emerges as an everyday but essential aspect of civil rights activism. And then finally, the connections that one might trace between these early experiences and more recent disturbing events. Uh, what the phrase driving while black means today, for example, um, these connections are inescapable and, and extremely thought provoking. In other words, having read this book, I highly recommend it. But it's better for her to tell us about it. So Professor Soren, I wanna give you the virtual floor and I wanna welcome you to the Maxwell School. Welcome. 
Thank you, Grant. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm sorry I can't be uh, on campus in person, but uh, this is just going to have to do. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And what I'm going to talk about today is something that is very important in a democratic society and yet something that we all take for granted. Um, but to, to start us off, I thought I would play just a little bit of music. So that was the Dixie Hummingbirds, it's Philadelphia group. And that last lyric was, prayer is your driver's license, faith is your steering wheel. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the importance of the automobile to um, the African-American community or African-American communities. Um, and I think you'll see how the automobile is also important to democracy in the United States for African-Americans. This, in case you don't recognize it, and it's barely recognizable, is the Times Square um, subway station. And I'm showing you this because I think that the story that I'm going to tell you, which is really about mobility and the role that mobility plays in a democratic society. And, and when you talk, start to talk about mobility, it's something that's not in the constitution. It's not, it's not in the Bill of Rights. Um, but if you think about it, it's key to living in a free society. And I think all of us have gotten just a little taste of the importance of mobility during this COVID pandemic because our mobility has been restricted. And there are many people that have been very upset about the restrictions that have been placed on their mobility. For African-Americans, the restrictions on mobility begin at the very beginning. You have to start with slavery um, from the moment uh, enslaved black people stepped ashore in the new world, their mobility was restricted. So in order to travel anywhere, you had to have a pass. You had to have permission from a white person to travel. Um, and this is an example of a paper pass. Uh, this one from 1843 and this one from Montpelier, which is the home of James Madison and it's for uh, Mrs. James Madison. So if you were out um, caught away from your plantation or your home, um, you needed this kind of a pass, or you, you, might, you might run away. And that was the way African-Americans took their mobility. They ran away. Now, the very earliest police departments in the United States, and this is really setting, excuse me, this is really setting up um, the relationship between African Americans in the past and the present. Um, the very first police departments were founded in this country in order to catch um, runaway slaves. Um, and here you can see at night um, one of the slave catchers. Um, and these were the men in the community, but sometimes women as well, um, often mounted on horses. So they were they had an imposing um, presence in these communities. And they would be going through the community every night looking for African Americans who were um, running away or who were gathering together when they weren't supposed to be gathering um, at night. And so you can see these two men having their passes, their paper passes checked um, by the slave catchers. Um, now, this was the reason for the formation of police departments. In other parts of the country, police departments were formed, um, so uh, in, in Missouri, for example, as Indian catchers or to protect the community from Native American people. So police departments begin as a way of controlling the movements um, and placing restrictions on people of color. Just to give you an example of what their badges look like, these are the um, badges that were established for the earliest police departments, and they are very similar to the badges that are still used um, by our police. 
So fast forward to the 20th century. We know that um, as many as 6 million African-Americans leave the rural South um, for the urban North. And they leave because of economic opportunity to get away from the kind of uh, horrible conditions in the South, the racism, the lynchings, um, the poverty. Um, and there were many ways to travel to the North. If you could, you could travel by train or bus, but very often the train stations were monitored. Um, white people patrolled the train stations and the bus stations because they didn't wanna lose their labor force. So the ideal way of getting out of the South, if you knew someone in the North who had a car a family member and they could bring that car down to the South under cover of darkness, you could tie all your possessions to that car and get out of the South. This is a family who's traveling with all their worldly possessions to Cranberry, New Jersey during the Great Migration. Let's talk a minute about um, mass transit. African-Americans preferred not to take buses and they preferred not to take trains unless they couldn't avoid it. And the reason was that public transportation was segregated north and south. Waiting rooms were segregated, bathrooms were segregated, buses were segregated. The bus drivers were quite mean actually. Um, they were armed, many of them had guns. There are many examples of bus drivers shooting people because they wouldn't move. Um, we know the story of Rosa Parks, but there are many other stories um, covered in the black press, never covered in the white press, um, of people being shot. Uh, there's a story of two, of a black and a white soldier, World War II soldiers sitting together because they were friends and the bus driver tells them, you're not allowed to sit together. And they say, no, 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 it's okay, we're friends. We wanna sit together. And he says, not on my bus. And he takes out a gun and the two have to go running. So bus drivers very cruelly enforce these segregation laws. And it was very unpleasant. Can you, you can imagine what it was like to take your children on a bus and have racial epithets um, tossed at them or to have them having to sit in the back of the bus because of their color. And here's an example of a segregated bus. And here's a train car. And you can see it says colored on the back of the seats. Now the trains for the, the colored car of the train was crowded, it was dirty, it was rarely cleaned as you see here. And here you can see um, white people in a, in a car, a train car riding in luxury. Um, and ironically, you can see the, the little bit of the white coat of the black man who's serving them. <coughs> Excuse me. This is Henry Ford Jr., uh, Henry Ford II, rather. Um, and I'm showing you this because when Af African-Americans moved to the North, they found that Henry Ford and Ford, the Ford Motor Company, they were willing to hire black people to work for Ford Motor Company. They were willing to pay them $5 a week, which was a great salary in those days. And they were able to join the middle class. Ford is credited, and it's Ford's father here, Henry Ford, the, uh, the original Henry Ford. He's credited with helping, helping, to um, develop the black middle class because he was willing to pay a decent wage, a decent salary to African-Americans working at his motor plant. And they were able then <clears throat> to buy automobiles as well as to all of the other trappings of middle-class life in the North. Which brings me to the automobile and why the automobile is so important for African-Americans. By the 1950s, African-Americans are joining the black middle class and they are able to purchase percolators and television sets and they're buying travel and they're buying automobiles just as 
white Americans are buying travel and they're buying automobiles and refrigerators and uh, fancy, fancy ovens for their kitchens. Um, and so you start to see black people traveling across the United States. What kind of cars did they buy? Well, there are lots of stereotypes about black people buying fancy cars. And I will tell you that black people did buy big cars um, and fancy cars, and there's a reason. This is uh, an advertisement for the Buick Electra Limited. The Buick Electra was a high-end car, and you can see it was quite plush inside. It was comfortable. Seats were very comfortable. It was very wide. It was very heavy. African-Americans wanted big, heavy cars. First of all, you had to carry everything with you. You carried blankets and pillows because you might have to sleep in the car. You carried extra water for the radiator. Some people even carried cans of gasoline because you didn't know if you'd be able to stop at a gas station. Would a gas station serve you? Would they sell to a black person? You knew that a hotel would not put you up for the night. You knew that restaurants wouldn't feed you. And perhaps if they did feed you, they might spit in your food. So you wanted to make sure that you carried everything with you. That meant you had to have a big trunk and you had to have a big car. Now the Buick Electra was, was very comfortable. Um, it was also very heavy. It would be hard to, to turn it over. So if you encountered an angry white mob, they would have a hard time turning your car over. So I really like this advertisement for the Buick Electra Limited because it says all the Electra Limited lacks is a fireplace. So your car was really, you were taking your home with you. you it was like a rolling living room, like, a, like your home on wheels. It was a protected, safe environment. With the windows up, your children were sitting in the back seat. They were prote protected from the racial animus that was elsewhere in the country and that they would face if they were on public transportation. Now the Buick was the most popular car for African-Americans. Um, it's a GM product. I actually just love this photograph because it's so quirky and, and weird. Um, and it's a, it's a photograph by Teeny Harris, who was a Pittsburgh, um, Pittsburgh photographer, but it really shows how African-Americans have joined the middle class. They're, these guys are going out hunting just like white, white Americans. Um, they've got their guns <clears throat> and they've killed two bears that they've strapped to this Buick. Um, and this shows a, a car trunk open with food and drink in the back. And obviously the family has pulled over to the side of the road to have a picnic. Um, African-Americans couldn't stop at restaurants and so they would carry their food with them. And everyone that I talk to um, talks about bringing sandwiches, bringing lemonade, bringing <clears throat> fried chicken, bringing all of their food. Sometimes people packed enough food for multiple days. If let's say you were from Chicago and you were going back home to Mississippi or Alabama, the deep South, um, and it would take you a couple of days, you would, you would sleep in the car along the way and stop along the way to, to eat. Now there's also a stereotype about African-Americans driving Cadillacs. And the truth is that only 3% of African-Americans purchase Cadillacs just as 3% of white Americans purchased Cadillacs. Many of the people who, who bought Cadillacs uh, could well afford them. This is Chuck Berry, and he certainly could afford to buy multiple Cadillacs. He owned many in the course of his lifetime. Um, this particular Cadillac is now at the National um, African-American Museum uh, at the Smithsonian. It's, it's a pretty spectacular, pretty outrageous looking car. Um, we know that Mahalia Jackson had a Cadillac. We know that Sammy Davis had a Cadillac. And they all felt they had to explain why they, as Black people, had Cadillacs, rather than, um, you know, no white person was ever asked to explain why they could purchase a Cadillac. Um, and clearly, these entertainers had the money to buy any car that they wanted. Well, um, many African Americans bought fancy cars <clears throat> because they could not purchase a home. Um, black neighborhoods were redlined, and redlining meant that you couldn't get a mortgage. And if you couldn't get a mortgage to buy property, to buy a house, you put your money into the next largest family purchase. 
and that next largest family purchase was a car. So often African-Americans had more money to put into their cars than white families who were, who were able to get mortgages. Um, and so there was a lot of criticism of black people for driving vehicles that were beyond their station. Um, and Cadillac for a long time didn't want to sell their cars to black people. They didn't think that was the right image for their automobile. So that racism persisted even in the purchase of, of automobiles. Um, and this is Medgar Evers field secretary for the NAACP. And his job was to travel to the site of cross burnings, to the site of, of uh, Klan uh, events, burning of churches, the lynching of black people. Um, he was six foot four and uh, he needed a car that was fast. Um, he might be chased. He was afraid he might be chased by an angry, angry whites, by Klansmen. And so the car that he bought was the Oldsmobile Rocket 88. Now the Rocket 88 was a fast car and it responded quickly to um, your touching the accelerator. So um, the reason that African-Americans chose specific cars is very different than the reason that white Americans who never had to think about these kinds of issues um, chose their cars. Of course, Medgar Evers was shot next to his car in, his dri in the driveway of his home in 1963. Um, African Americans did purchase automobiles for show, as did white Americans. It was a it was a point of prestige, and this is a showy car if there ever was one. It's a 1930 Cadillac. Um, it is just a spectacular car, um, and the couple wearing their uh, raccoon coats um, perhaps are going back to the South to visit relatives. Now, um, one of the reasons for buying a fancy car was so that you could take it back home after you've made good in the North. And you could say, look how successful I have become. I've got a good job. I've got a great car. So it was a little bit about showboating um, with the family back home and the, and the neighbors back home. So what is the intersection of race and space? And how does the car change African-American life? Think for a moment about upstate New York. I think upstate New York is the best place to, to think about this uh, commute, the way, we, the way we use space. Um, I live in Springfield Center, and if you go from here to Cooperstown, it's about 10 miles. If you go from here to Cherry Valley, it's about eight miles. And I would say there's a, there's a new town every five to eight miles in upstate New York. If you go along Route 20, every five to eight to 10 miles, you're gonna come to a different town. And every single one of those towns has its own Episcopal church, its own general store, its own post office, its own Baptist church, its own Methodist church. It, it was funny, uh, once my husband who was Jewish asked me, why do all these little towns have the same churches? Why do they all have the same churches? Well, they all have the same churches because people didn't leave their little town. People didn't go from Springfield Center where I live to Cooperstown every day. People didn't go, you know, from uh, Cherry Valley to Richfield Springs every day. They stayed within their little community. And this is before the automobile. People didn't go very far from home. They stayed right in their little town. So in each little town, you needed that general store, that post office, that, uh, that, that church of every, de every denomination. The automobile really changes the way we use space. And people start crisscrossing the country and they're going to in large distances in a very short period of time. And this really opens up the country in ways that it's never been opened up before. Um, and African-Americans who are living in African-American communities or African-American neighborhoods are leaving those black neighborhoods and going to other black neighborhoods. But in order to get to those black neighborhoods, you have to cross into white space. <clears throat> and almost every space in the country is white space, right? So it's really, even with the automobile, <clears throat> even though you're in this protected environment, you are having to cross into white space in order to uh, take your automobile to uh, the beach or to a resort or to, or back home um, during the Great Migration to visit family 
or even across town to visit neighbors or friends. <clears throat> so the, the, the highway really becomes very important for African-Americans because they like to stay when they're traveling on the highway. If you stay on the highway, you don't have to go through these little towns where you don't know how you will be received. You don't know if you'll be welcome in these little towns. <clears throat> if you get on the highway, you can just pull off in a little rest area and have your meal and not have to think about, well, do I have to stop? And you know, what happens if I pull onto this little main street and people see that there are black people in the car? You don't have to worry so much about how you'll be perceived in little towns that you're not familiar with. Um, but there's a problem with the highways because in order to build the highways, the state has to take land from people. And very often that land comes at the expense of black communities. So as we're building, as the nation is building highways in the 50s and 60s, they're building those highways right through black communities, right through black cemeteries, right through black churches. And they're destroying many of the, uh, they're destroying black businesses and they're destroying black neighborhoods. This is um, the building of I-95 in Rye, New York. Um, and it was built right through a black cemetery. There are other dangers though that, that African-Americans encounter when they go out on the road. They encounter signs like this one. So the landscape itself is just fraught with, with um, with dangerous um, signs and symbols, but also real possible violence. This is a welcome to Klan country sign in Alabama. But we know that at the entrance of, as you're going south on, on 95 through North Carolina, at the entrance to the state of North Carolina is a huge banner, the Klan welcomes you. Automobile accidents were another danger for black people. If you got into an automobile accident, even if you were not critically injured, if you were bleeding and um, were waiting for an ambulance, there might be no there might not be a hospital that could take care of you. Hospitals were segregated in the 50s and into the 60s, and there were only 200 black hospitals in the United States. Most of them did not have trauma units and many of them were not accredited hospitals. Um, and so if you like Bessie Smith, the, the blues, the great blues singer, if you got into an automobile accident, you could bleed to death before you could be cared for at a hospital or you could um, be taken from one hospital to another hospital to another hospital um, and die as a result of not being treated um, quickly enough. There are many examples, um, even of, of sports figures, of college athletes who were injured in automobile accidents and they died as a result of their inability to get care at a hospital um, for injuries that perhaps would not have been life-threatening. There are even some historically black colleges that would not permit their athletes to travel because they knew how dangerous it was in, in the event that their athletes um, got into a car accident. Now there were some black hospitals and there were some black hospital wards that white hospitals had, but those black hospital wards were filthy. They received black patients received less care. Um, and sometimes there were only four or five beds. So if all four or five beds were full, they would turn you away. And ambulances felt no problem turning people away. Um, and indeed, if there was a car accident, the first question that the dispatcher would ask would be, are the people black or white? If a white, a car driven by white people hit a car driven by black people, they would have to call two different ambulances, one white ambulance and one black ambulance. And the black ambulance was not allowed to take the people away until the white ambulance arrived and took those people away, further delaying the treatment for African-Americans. So you can see how this story encompasses the disparities in healthcare as well 
um, as the automobile. <coughs> Excuse me. There were also signs like this one. So when you think about um, how African-American children grew up hating their color, hating being black or feeling um, that they were inferior, you see signs like this one for the, uh, this was a, a fast food chain on the West Coast that started in Salt Lake City called the Coon Chicken Inn. It was all over California um, as well as Utah. So there were, there were all of these not so subtle messages about African-Americans and who they were. And of course, this is the banner across Main Street in Greenville, Texas. Greenville welcome, the blackest land, the whitest people. Now Greenville had a reputation. They had had a lynching in the early 20th century. So people who lived in Texas knew about Greenville's reputation. And this was a terrifying banner. You, know, you didn't wanna linger in a town that had this across the main street. But then there were the sundown towns. There were hundreds of sundown towns all over the United States. Um, many of them had signs like this one at the entrance of the town or the exit of the town. Um, but many of them simply were places that you had to know that you were not welcome. Um, and particularly you could work there during the day but if you were in town after the sunset, you were, you were subject to violence. And, and I say there were hundreds of towns. There were sundown towns in New York. There were sundown towns in Ohio, New Jersey, Connecticut, all over the United States. Sheboygan, Wisconsin was a sundown town. Manitowoc was a sundown town. Um, uh, Palm Beach was a sundown town. These were, there were hundreds of them and they were frightening for African-Americans. There's one story that Thurgood Marshall tells in his autobiography where he says he was minding his own business. He was just waiting for a train, standing on the train platform and um, a white man with a gun comes up to him, puts the gun in his ribs and says, nigger boy, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm, I'm just waiting for the train to Shreveport. And he says, well, you better be out of town by four o'clock because the sun has never set on a nigger in this town. So sundown towns were, were since they were all over the place. And many of them had signs like this, but others were just, you just had to know. They were, they were sundown towns by reputation. Um, it, it could be dangerous when you were traveling, but I think it was so important and courageous for African-Americans to say, you know what, we're gonna go out on the road. We're gonna take our children on vacation. We're going to encounter people. We're going to see the country. We have a right to educate our children um, in mon at monuments and museums, and we're going to take them um, to these places. And there were real dangers, um, uh, dangers of violence, because um, there were Klan people that were out, and there were there are examples of of black families being, um, I guess, bushwhacked, is being trapped, um, being dragged out of their cars, being chased. Uh, being lynched. So it was, it could be dangerous depending on where you were traveling and when. One of the reasons African Americans liked to travel at night when it was dark was because if you, if you were traveling in the dark, it was less likely that people could see who was in the car. Um, and also fewer people were on the road at two or three or four in the morning. Um, so it might be uh, a little safer. I, I don't even know what to say about this slide. Um, it's very perplexing to me. Um, but this is a slide from a fair in Colorado. And you look at it and you think, I wonder what they were thinking. But obviously the point of wearing your Klan robe to a county fair or a state fair would be to intimidate people. And can you imagine what it would be like to encounter this group of folks um, if you were just headed to the fair? So to counter all of this in 1936, an African-American man from, uh, named Victor Green, a publisher in New York City, published the Negro Motorist Green Book. Um, now this is the, the travel guide that everybody knows about. It was a alphabetical listing of hotels, motels, taverns, restaurants, um, places that would be welcoming to African-Americans. This was not the first travel guide and it was not the last travel guide. Um, Victor Green got the idea because he had a bad travel experience. But the federal government had produced its own segregated travel guide 
um, at the end of the depression in order to encourage travel across the country. So there had been travel guides before and there are probably uh, 20, 30, maybe 40 different travel guides, but this is the most long lasting of the guides. Um, Victor Green believed that travel was fatal to prejudice. And he believed that if, if middle-class African-Americans like this gentleman could just go out on the road and meet white Americans, if, if white Americans could, could just encounter black people, they would see that, that blacks are just like whites. Um, and his, his goal was to put himself out of business. He believed that travel was fatal to prejudice and that we need to meet one another and encounter one another in order to um, understand one another. This is Victor Green and this is Alma Green, his wife. And I show you this picture of Alma because everyone talks about Victor Green um, and his Green book. Well, Victor Green gets sick in the end of the 1950s. Um, and he steps away from the production of the Green Book. And he leaves that totally in Alma's hands. He's still the face of the Green Book, but Alma takes over as the publisher. <clears throat> and she has four women working for her. And so it's a wholly woman owned and operated business in the 1950s, totally unheard of in the United States in publishing. So I give Alma Green a lot of credit. Victor Green and Alma had um, agents all over the United States. And these agents helped them find places that were welcoming to African-Americans. And they start out with just New York and New Jersey and Connecticut, and they expand and expand until by 1966, the Green, Green Book was covering the entire United States, uh, Alaska, Bermuda, Canada, and Mexico. And they were really, reaching out across the world as well. These agents, many of whom worked for historically black colleges that had traveling um, teams or traveling singing groups. Um, and their, their singing groups had to stay in various places around the country when they did their shows. And so uh, these agents knew of places that you could stay if you were African-American and they shared those with Victor Green and he put those into the Green Book. And then he started to build up his list by word of mouth. If you were an African-American traveling and you stayed in a good place, you would report it to Victor Green and he would put it in the Green Book. Well, this is also the time <clears throat> when the first generation of black executives, they were being hired by major American corporations like Seagram's and Coca-Cola, uh, Marlboro, um, General Foods, and they were traveling for business and they needed places to stay. And they loved the Green Book because it provided these kind of middle-class places to stay when they couldn't stay in the same hotels that their white counterparts were staying in. And they also gave recommendations to Green that went into the guide. Now you could have a simple listing in the guide or you could take out a display ad like this one. And this is an SO gas station um, in Malvern, Arkansas. The good thing about SO was that African-Americans were permitted at SO gas stations. We would call this ExxonMobil. It's ExxonMobil today with Standard Oil. They were permitted at these gas stations to use the bathrooms. And because they could use the bathrooms, they, these were the only gas stations that were, would permit black people to use gas station, uh, use their bathrooms. Um, black people bought Esso gas. Um, Esso was owned and Standard Oil was owned by the Rockefeller family. And the Rockefellers were very involved in civil rights um, and they were very supportive of social justice. And I believe that that is the reason that Esso um, was so interested in pro providing um, SO gas providing bathrooms for African Americans to use. They also made a deal with Victor Green and they bought thousands of copies of the Green Book and they distributed it at SO gas stations. Um, and that was one of the things that made Victor Green's Green Book successful. He was able to um, get the SO gas stations to distribute his, his guide. 
when I say it's for the middle class, I, I think this is the perfect cover because you can see here this very attractive middle class couple. They have max, uh, matched luggage, quite a bit of it. They have, uh, they're in a suburban middle class neighborhood. So we see their, their car, we see their house in the background. Um, and this is the group that, that Green is courting with his guide. And you see that it says, carry your green book with you. You may need it. The Negro Motorist Green Book is incredibly polite. It is not at all um, out there in terms of talking about segregation. It doesn't talk about segregation. It doesn't talk about racism. Um, he knew that in order for white people to support the Negro Motorist Green Book, that he had to have this coded language. So the entire thing is written in this very uh, polite, middle-class coded language. African-Americans knew exactly the reason for the Negro Motorist Green Book, but it never discusses uh, segregation. It's very coded and says things like, carry your green book with you, you may need it. But as I said, there were lots of different guides. Um, and this is just an example of the 1942 Afro travel map that was produced by the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper. There were lots of other ways you could get travel information in the back of black magazines, um, in, the, in black newspapers. Every one of them had information on places to travel. Uh, if you wanted to go to the Catskills for the weekend, there was information about traveling to the black resorts in the Catskills um, in the Amsterdam news. So African-Americans found travel information in, in all of their literature, but also by word of mouth. People talked about it. People shared information about scary places to travel and about places that were safe. And there are a variety of types of places that were safe. This is a colored YMCA dorm room. This is Rock Rest, which is, um, and if you've been to the National African American Museum, you may have seen this rock because it's it's there now. Rock Rest was a, a guest house that you could stay in for week long visits. Um, and, and the visitors that came here came to get away from the racism of the world. It was isolated, it's in Kittery, Maine, and it was just a, a respite from the racism that they faced on a daily basis. It's basically a little New England cottage that they expanded with a large dormer. And this is, this is a contemporary picture that I actually took. <clears throat> and here you can see, um, it was operated by Hazel and, and Clayton Sinclair. And in addition to providing uh, these week long sojourns for African-American families, they also catered um, fancy teas and fancy luncheons for the middle-class black community of Portsmouth um, and Kittery. And here you can see some ladies enjoying a lovely luncheon with their, with their hat on. Well, after you get the heat shield out, there's another plastic cover up underneath. Okay. Another type of, uh, of accommodation would be um, a, just a, a motel. And motels were growing in popularity in the 1950s. Um, and this was a, these were places that were just along the highway and you could pull your car, your vehicle right up to the doorway. And then in the morning, you could just hop right back on the highway. Um, and this particular Mackenzie Court is in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It looks very much like those little tourist accommodations that you see along, uh, along Route 20 in upstate New York. But if you've ever seen the movie, The Green Book, um, all of the places that are shown um, in the Green Book are dumps, total dumps. And I think that was that facilitated the story that went along with the story of that film. But there were actually African-American luxury hotels. <clears throat> and this is an example of one. This is the Hotel Teresa that's in New York City. It's on the edge of Harlem. Um, there was also the Majestic Hotel in Cleveland and the Hampton House in Miami. Um, so there were these beautiful resort hotels as well. Um, this is the hotel that Castro, Fidel Castro, stayed in when he came to New York. He wanted to embarrass 
the American government, excuse me, by talking about uh, the segregation that African Americans faced. So he stayed here at the Hotel Teresa instead of staying at a white hotel. But also uh, these accommodations pr often provided another way for women to make money. Um, if, a, if a household had an extra bedroom, a spare bedroom, if the kids were off at college or um, they just happened to have a large house and they had a spare bedroom or two, um, many women would <clears throat> take in people for the night, African-American travelers for the night. And they would provide them with a breakfast and sometimes even a dinner. So this is kind of your very first uh, bed and breakfast. Uh, you could uh, stay at Mrs. Mrs. Smith's home. <clears throat> and sometimes there were rooms even um, at funeral homes. There might be a few extra bedrooms. You know, funeral homes are often in a very nice uh, home in a community and people would stay at the black funeral home. <clears throat> and some of them talk about, you know, going up the stairs or going past the coffin room, um, going up the stairs to their, their bedroom, or they would stay at the home of the pastor. Um, sometimes uh, the pastors of black churches would provide accommodations for, for black travelers. And this is an example of one of the display ads um, in the Negro Motorist Green Book. <clears throat> they were often accompanied by photographs and the proprietors put the pictures of themselves in these ads so they could say, look at me, I am black. You will receive hospitality here. You will be welcomed. You don't have to worry um, about what you'll find at this place. And I do like to mention the uh, national parks. Uh, I think Ken Burns did a documentary saying the national parks, America's greatest idea. Um, and they were open to everyone. Well, yes, the parks were open to everyone, but all of the concessions in the parks were, were operated by private interests. The, all the tourist accommodations, the souvenir shops, the cabins, the hotels, the restaurants were all operated by private individuals and they were segregated. So this actually shows the picnic grounds for Negroes at Shenandoah National Park. Um, but the parking lots were segregated, the bathrooms were segregated and the accommodations were segregated. So even though the parks were open to everyone, the accommodations were still segregated and they were certainly not equal. Uh, but I would also argue for the automobile as one of the most important tools that African, African Americans had in the fight for civil rights. I do not believe that you could even have the civil rights movement without the automobile. And I'll tell you why. Here's a uh, civil rights, this is Birmingham, Alabama. Um, here is a, a civil rights march um, and boycott. And the man at the front holding the equal opportunity and human dignity sign um, is about to be driven back to his hotel, which is right here the Gaston Motel. And all these people are in the street outside the Gaston Motel because it's just been bombed. Um, all of these businesses that grew up around the automobile, around travel for African-Americans, like the Gaston Motel, provided housing and food for civil rights workers. And therefore <clears throat> they were imperiled. I mean, these, these became dangerous places because um, they were involved in civil rights. And the Gaston Motel um, was bombed in the 1960s. This is the Jenkins Microbus. It's a VW um, bus, and it was used to register voters. If you think about the, the task of registering voters, of, of teaching people how to pass the poll test, of taking health care out into the Black community, you couldn't do that without a car. You couldn't do it on foot. You couldn't do it with a bus. You had to have, you couldn't do it with public transportation. You had to have your own vehicle. And so people use their own vehicles or vehicles that they purchased in order to go out into communities and bring, um, bring voting um, rights and, and teach, people, teach people how to vote and teach people how to uh, pass the poll, task, uh, poll tests 
um, and also bringing vaccinations to children, education to children. Um, this is um, Martin Luther King ushering some women into a car. <clears throat> They were about, this is in Montgomery, Alabama. They are trying to desegregate the buses, the Montgomery bus boycott, very famous boycott. Um, but there were boycotts all over the South. They all required automobiles. In order to desegregate the buses, they needed to find a way to get people to work without taking the bus. Because if they could keep people off of the buses, they could bankrupt the bus companies. They could force the bus companies to desegregate. But if people kept taking the buses, the bus companies would not leave, listen and would not desegregate. What they did was to purchase a fleet of automobiles and they used these automobiles to drive people to work. The, they were able to um, bankrupt the Montgomery bus company. And this is some information that's only been recently discovered in someone's attic and they found the records of the bus company, um, Martin Luther King and the organizers of the Montgomery bus boycott cut the revenue of the bus company by 69%, enormous with these automobiles. And there was another problem. If you flew, if you were a civil rights leader and you flew into any city, you could not get from your, ho from your airport to your hotel because only the white cab companies were allowed to pick up people at the airport. So you would be stranded at the airport, except for what were called you drive it cars, or the beginning of the rental car. So African-Americans would fly into these airports and they would rent a car and then they would use that car to drive to the black hotels um, since the black cab companies could not pick them up. And it really facilitated the movement. Otherwise, there would, there would have been no way for them to, to actually get around. So rental cars were a huge part of, of civil rights. These were tools. Um, the, car, the automobile becomes a tool that's very important. At the same time that all of this is going on, that there's direct action in the streets, there's also court action going on. Um, now, I mentioned this, this network of hotels, restaurants, uh, roadhouses, nightclubs that grows up around African Americans who are traveling. And these are all segregated um, hotels and restaurants um, because Hilton and Howard Johnson's, the main white chains, the large, all of the main, uh, the large main chains are segregated. They will not permit African Americans to stay there. Um, at the same time, they're fighting in the courts, the NAACP and the Urban League are fighting in the courts to bust open these major white chains. That happens with the Civil Rights Act in 1964. When Hilton is broken open, when Howard Johnson's is broken open, African-Americans go there and they start to stay there and to eat there because they can. And they're doing it because they've worked so hard to break open these chains. The irony is that all of these small black owned businesses start to go out of business because black people are staying at these chains. It's also not that all black people stopped using the black businesses, but that white people never do use the black businesses. Um, and so there just isn't enough business and they go out of business. Um, and this is uh, a, a demonstration in front of a, of a Hilton Hotel in Atlanta. So I, it brings me back to this idea of space and race and whether or not um, America has ever really reckoned with the idea that African-Americans are allowed in any space. We have heard of people calling the police because African-Americans were sitting quietly in a Starbucks. We've heard of people calling the police because a young woman was sleeping in the common room at um, Yale. We have heard of people calling the police because they've seen black people um, <clears throat> on the porch of their own home. Um, and of course, um, whites murdered Ahmaud Aubrey, 
because he was had gone out for a jog in what was perceived of as a white neighborhood, as white space. So uh, the, this kind of racialized nature of space in America is something that we are still dealing with. And when African-Americans go out in their automobiles, they are still traversing areas that are considered white spaces. And there's still reason to be concerned, especially in encounters with law enforcement. This is Philando Castile. In his short life, <clears throat> he was stopped more than 45 times by the police for no reason because he was driving while black. And ultimately he was murdered um, by the police while he was sitting in his car. We all saw that um, video. And of course, um, George Floyd was dragged out of his um, van and um, murdered by a policeman who's now, um, the, as we speak, on trial for his murder. Um, and this is the, um, the, the artwork that appeared on The New Yorker um, showing all of these people who have been um, murdered in the United States. So I, I end with this cartoon, um, newspaper cartoon called Handy Hints for Drivers Stopped by Police. Be courteous, obey all lawful orders, have license and registration ready, avoid being black. Um, one of the things that <coughs> African-American parents still do is what I call the talk. They have their talk with their uh, driver age children about how to behave if you're stopped by an, a police officer. And, and is it possible, the question I have is, is it possible to keep your child safe um, when they encounter a police officer with a gun? And, and what should we do about it? Um, it seems that, that we have now <clears throat> an opportunity. African-Americans are only 13% of the American population. But the murder of George Floyd has made the, um, a lot of white people in this country realize what African-Americans have realized for a long time, that there is a disproportionate way that justice is meted out in this country. And so <clears throat> perhaps now is a time when African-Americans and their allies and their collaborators can make some substantive changes um, that will make this country uh, more democratic. So I will stop there and leave it to your questions. Okay, Gretchen, thank you so much for that. Um, the presentation is very, very powerful material, obviously. We did have one question um, come in early on that I wanted to put to you and then, We'll go from there. I have a couple more uh, that, that I see as well. Uh, but this person was curious to hear more about uh, the sundown towns and that phenomenon and what you found in your research there. And in particular, um, before, before the Green Book um, or before this information became more widely disseminated, what were the different ways that African-Americans who were traveling could know um, about these towns, if they didn't, you know, if they didn't put a big banner up, you know, uh, as you're driving into them, how, how would they, how would they know and avoid um, encountering the things that might happen to them in the, at night? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the very first guide that was created was created in the 30s. So it's really as early as that. Um, and it was created by the federal government. The, what the guide doesn't tell you, what none of these guides tell you is places to avoid. It only tells you places where you'll be welcome. Mm. So you really had to, um, African-Americans always planned their trips very carefully. They would sit down with maps and with um, newspapers and magazines and guidebooks and plan every move so that they knew exactly where they would be when they were taking a trip. There was a lot of word of mouth um, I, I did a lot of oral histories and people told me that um, they found out because 
so-and-so told so-and-so who told so-and-so who told so-and-so and they passed that information on. Um, I was, I went to um, Albany to get my hair done and I was talking to a woman who was in her nineties um, and in the, in the beauty parlor. And we were talking about New Jersey. I'm a native of New Jersey. And she said to me, well, she grew up in Brooklyn um, and she wanted to go to Atlantic City when she was young, a bunch of, she and a bunch of friends wanted to go to Atlantic City, but they knew New Jersey was a Klan state. And I said, I grew up in New Jersey. New Jersey's not a Klan state. <laughs> um, and she said, no, 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 it's a Klan state. Um, she was telling me how she knew it was a, a Klan state. And I was really curious. So I went and I went to the newspapers and sure enough, New Jersey was a Klan state. Um, and I found lots of examples of Klan rallies and cross burnings. And I thought, she, absolutely right. So what she told me was that they would drive very slowly when they needed gas and they would, they would look at people's faces mm. and they would try to ascertain if people were staring at them, if people were angry, if people looked mean before they would stop for gas or before they would stop at all. And they wouldn't stop for food. African Americans tended not to stop except for gasoline. That was the only reason, or unless your car broke down. Um, and that, that was another reason for buying a reliable car because you didn't want your car to break down. But it was word of mouth um, and it was planning. It was staying on the highway as much as you could. Although there are several stories of people getting off the highway because they couldn't avoid it and getting into trouble. Um, but it was really a matter, uh, and some people wouldn't travel. You know, I, I interviewed some folks who said they, you know, they're um, Spencer Crew, who is um, who teaches at um, George Mason University, and he was the first director of the, uh, uh, he was the director, first African American director of the American Museum of Natural, uh, let's see, Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. He told me that his father had this great car. It was a deuce and a quarter. That was, the, that was the car and his father liked to polish it and wash it every weekend he'd polish it and wash it, but they never went anywhere. <laughs> because that car was, it was kind of like, they, they just didn't go anywhere because his, his family was afraid to travel. And so they had a car and they could use it to go, you know, to, this, to the market, but they stayed right in their neighborhood. Somebody else, this was um, building off of uh, your notion of um, race and space. Uh, and and it was interested in in wondering whether you'd see also a connection with the notion of leisure time being something that would be as racialized as space. Because in, I, I I could imagine some intersections there with you know in order to be able to travel you've also got to have the the time off right and and there's a there's obviously some some pretty stark racial divisions around around um, occupation and, and the way that, that people were treated for time off and that kind of thing. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that or yes. what, what does that bring up for you? Well, one of the things that, um, that happens with, with um, the growth of the middle class is that people, people do start to get time off. And they do, you know, when they're working in the Ford plant or they're working, you know, my, my mother was a school teacher and my father was an engineer. And they, they, do, they did get time off in the summer um, for vacations. My mother had the entire summer off as a teacher. So um, as African-Americans join the middle class or become part of the middle class, they're starting to get time off. And that's the time when they decide they wanna go south to visit family members um, that they've moved away from during the great migration. Um, but the places that they go for vacation are racialized. So, they go to resorts, they go to beaches that are segregated, black beaches like American Beach in, in Florida, Ink Beach um, on Martha's Vineyard, which is pejorative right there. It's still called Ink Beach, by the way. Hmm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. By all the locals, they still call it Ink Beach. Uh, there was a, a, a resort at Atlantic City has got a segregated beach and a segregated neighborhood in New Jersey. Um, Del Verde was a um, was a segregated uh, resort area that a lot of Hollywood people uh, went to. It's outside of Los Angeles. So there were these, these resort communities that African-Americans went to um, 
in that were all over the country. But in, again, you had to go through white space to get to these safe black places. Uh, you, I want this question that that um, you and I have talked about a little bit before, but um, you know, you you kind of hinted at some of the more personal aspects of your book when you were talking at the end of your remarks about having the talk uh, with a child about um, how to deal with with driving while black or or just other things that 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 black people have to be aware of in this country. Um, there's also parts of your book where you um, talk more personally about things that you learned about your upbringing and about your parents through doing the research for the book, that you had sort of a, a different appreciation for things that you didn't really see at the time, partly because I guess you were being shielded from them. I, if you're willing to, to talk about that, I, I, think, I think the folks that are here would be very interested in, in, in hearing more about that. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> when I did my oral histories, I interviewed um, people in my own generation who would have been the kids in the back seat. And then I interviewed people in the older generation who would have been, you know, my parents' age and um, older. Both of my parents are deceased now, but they, and I didn't know anything about the Green Book. So um, when, I, when I talked to people who were in my generation, I found out that we were pretty clueless. We didn't know anything about what was going on around us. Um, when we went, I used to go with my parents and my brother back to Fayetteville, North Carolina every summer to visit my grandmother's uh, family and my mother's family. <clears throat> and we stayed in the black neighborhood. And to be honest, I don't remember ever seeing a, oh, excuse me. Um, I don't remember ever seeing a, um, a sign, a Jim Crow sign, hmm. but we were always in the black neighborhood. We never hmm. strayed from that neighborhood. Um, and we traveled, we would leave at three o'clock in the morning and travel in the dark for most of the way. Um, my father would gas up the car in New Jersey. And I always thought these were peculiar habits. Why, if we're going on vacation, did we have to leave so early? Why couldn't we sleep? I mean, it just seemed counterintuitive for a vacation. Um, and as I did the research, I found out that this was typical for black families to travel in the dark, to gas up. You know, my brother and I thought, why don't we stay at a hotel? Our friends stay at a hotel. We'd like to stay at a hotel. We never stayed at a hotel. We never went to a restaurant. We always carried our own food. We always ate by the side of the road. We had one of those really heavy old metal Coleman coolers that my parents carried in the car. And it was full of, of food and, and beverages, but we never stopped. You know, we wanted to go to a restaurant, but we didn't, we never did. We ate what was in the cooler. Um, and then I, as I discovered that this is what black families were doing. And I thought that's, that's part of a, you know kind of black family tradition. It's not, and it's out of necessity, it was out of necessity not wanting to stop. And I, you know, as you get into the 1960s, I'm sure there were places that were integrated. There were places that were breaking down those barriers, some, but how did you know where they were? Mm. You know, you didn't know. So you just kept doing what you were doing. And I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago to a law firm and one of the lawyers was African-American young woman said to me, you know what? My family still travels at night. And I never knew why they did that. But she said it's become part of their family way of doing things. And they still go on vacation. They leave at, you know, three, two, three in the morning. And I thought, wow, that's, <laughs> that is part of that same tradition. We've got a lot of folks that aren't asking questions, but they want me just to thank you for the presentation and also for the way that you're explaining this topic, um, it's 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 making some folks sad, but I think in a you know in a productive way. But they are, they they wanted me to communicate that to you. So on, beh um, on behalf of on behalf of those folks, thank let you. Let me ask you this question. Um, um, it, it, this is a this is a different angle that I hadn't thought of. Again, this person asking this question, but given the importance of of a car that was reliable 
And that I think is in your book too, as another reason for buying yeah. the cars that they, because your life literally could depend on the car not breaking down and not leaving you stranded somewhere at night in the wrong place. Um, what was the role of mechanics in African-American communities? Were they kind of revered or was they, did they have a, a more important um, role than typical because, because the, what they were doing for the cars was so important to these families? You know, one of the things that I've noticed is that <clears throat> I thought the very first um, dealership was in the 60s, but I recently discovered that there were Black auto dealers in the 30s, and several of them started as mechanics. Hmm. So the mechanic was able, which, you know, I, I think that's probably not the way somebody becomes an auto dealer today, um, but several of, several mechanics were then able to, because they were so good at caring for people's cars, they were able to make enough money to buy a dealership and become an automobile dealer and sell cars to, in the black neighborhood. And I thought that was fascinating mm. um, because I would think that's not the, the route today. <laughs> I think um, those, those places are also listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book, but also in these other travel guides, you know, places that you, where you could get your car fixed, where you took your car to get it fixed. Um, it's only when white people start to realize that black people have money and that they can get some of that money that they start opening up their businesses to black people. Mm -hmm. But many of them still won't allow you to use their bathrooms. You know, they'll sell, they'll sell you a car, they'll um, sell you gasoline, but you can't use the bathroom. So African-Americans then gravitate to those dealers who are African-American who are selling cars or to SO gas stations who will let you use the bathrooms. Stephanie uh, Kafera is similar to me and her um, curiosity, usually when when, when I'm interviewing somebody on Zoom, my last question will be about something that's in the background that they've got. She has a question for you that comes out of this. Um, she's very curious about what she says, the photograph over your left shoulder. I don't know that means our left and looking at you or your left shoulder, but maybe you could tell us about both of the photographs. Well, she's asking the wrong question because I, I did a lecture um, a few weeks ago for a news outlet and my granddaughter who is six said to me, she didn't ask you the right question. And I said, Lily, what's the right question? And she said, who's that cute little girl in the photo? <laughs> <laughs> so um, with this one is a poster from an exhibition that I did at the Jewish Museum called Bridges and Boundaries, African-Americans and American Jews. I think that's, uh, that, yep, that's, is that what about, what about, what about the one on the other side, your other shoulder there, the, the, oh, that, the is, house. Yeah. Um, that is a, a pencil drawing by an artist whose name is Fritz Vogt. And he traveled around upstate New York in the 19th century. And he made drawings of people's houses. And that's a house from Cherry Valley. Okay. Okay, so there's two questions that have come in that are that are related in a way. I'll put them both together um, as a two-part question. But um, Sarah Prowley wanted to know whether um, black women traveled without men, uh, and and then um, Eric Rogers wants to know whether black travelers ever traveled armed uh, because because of the dangers. Um. A women traveling, yes, I have seen actually some photographs of, of black women who traveled with, without, um, without men. Um, they, they're really considered, any woman traveling without a man in this time period is kind of in the 50s, in the, especially the 30s and 40s, but also into the 50s was kind of considered a really adventurer. I mean, really. Um, most of the uh, driving was done by men, but there are some women that certainly traveled without men. Um, and as you get into the late 50s and 60s, you're having more and more women 
joining the workforce, well, even in the 40s, you're having more women joining the workforce and driving to work. So um, women are learning to drive, and yes, they're traveling, they're traveling without men. Did they travel armed? Um, there's a great story about Eleanor Roosevelt um, where she is going to, I think, the Highland Field, you know, the Highland Field School, which was a mm -hmm. civil rights training camp. And someone goes to pick her up with their vehicle. And Eleanor says, you know, we, we need to uh, be very careful. And the woman, you know, reaches down and pats her, her revolver and says, well, we've got this, we've got this gun with us. So I do know that story, which is a, a really good one. And, and she just picked up Eleanor Roosevelt in her car and she's got a gun and it's just the two women. Um, when, my, when I was a kid, we used to go camping and African-Americans tend not to go camping very much, just like they tend not to go hiking in the woods very much. Um, and the reason is that you're likely, you don't know if you're gonna encounter some crazy white mob or some crazy white guy with a gun. So um, when we went camping in New Jersey, we used to go to a state forest that was very well patrolled um, and that had these very controlled campsites. Um, and my father always had a rifle in the car. And I never knew why, I always thought it, I thought it was peculiar, but my father um, used to do training for the police on the, on, he did this on the side, he was an engineer. And so he had a lot of rifles and shotguns and pistols and all kinds of guns. And um, he always carried that gun. It was in a case, it never came out of its case, but it was alongside the side of the, of the uh, station wagon. And I always thought it was peculiar, but it, you know, I never said anything about it or did anything about it. Um, but I, I think people did carry guns. I don't know that people, said they carried guns because if you're caught with a gun by the police the assumption is that you're even if you have a license for that gun uh, and Philando Castile is murdered because he has a licensed gun in the car he says that he, when he told the police officer that he had a gun in the car the policeman shot and killed him so um, I think that's a pretty dangerous thing to do mm. uh couple of questions about your own experience in working on the book and the documentary. Um, the first one is, uh, you obviously um, know, going in, the kind of things that you're going to encounter and you're going to be learning deeply about, and you know that, you know, they'll, they're going to be disturbing. Um, was there anything in your research, though, that really caught you up like that you weren't expecting to learn that that uh was more concerning than other anything else that that we might you know we might be generally familiar with in the story of civil rights and african-american struggles i well i think i was i think i was most surprised by the um the physicians that turn people away from hospitals i i just mm. couldn't understand how they could um, take their um, their oath, <laughs> the oath that they take to do no harm and, um, and actually turn dying people away from hospitals, doctors and nurses. It, it was, I found that just absolutely appalling. And there's one story um, that was particularly tough to take. Um, Walter White, who was the head of the NAACP, very, very fair-skinned African-American with blue eyes. And his father, also very fair-skinned and had blue eyes, and his father was hit by a car. Um, he stepped off the curb, he was hit by a car, and the person that hit him was a physician. And this is in the early, late 1940s, early 1950s, I think. Yeah, so this physician hits him, and so he, he picks him up, bundles him up, puts him in the car, and they, he drives him off to his hospital this guy's a doctor that hit him and they're treating him and they're working on him they're trying to save his life and then his son-in-law um hears that he's been hit by a car and he rushes to the hospital and then the doctors see the son-in-law the son-in-law is a very brown skinned black man and when they see and they figure out that this guy's black 
they say, oh my God, he's black. They take him from the treatment room, take him out of the hospital, hustle him out in the rain across the street to the Negro ward, which is full of rats and roaches and they, and he dies. And I, you know, that story for me, it was, it was mind blowing <laughs> because I can't imagine the, um, these are, these are doctors and nurses. This is the man that hit him with his car and they, the lack of c concern um, and the, the hatred uh, and the evil, it was, was staggering. So, um, and it was funny because you really think of color, the guy couldn't even tell he was black. You know, he was so fair skinned. So this, this notion of what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be white? is silly almost because by it's not biologically constructed at all um it's constructed by stupid human beings <laughs> um and and that i guess was the uh, i guess it's something i knew but it that re that story really um hit home on that idea about mm. what what does it even mean what does race even mean to human beings what makes somebody white or or black you know, if you look at people who are, say, Portuguese, um, who are very, very dark skinned, but white, uh, you know, but they're considered white people. <clears throat> yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. We've, we've got a, just a few minutes left, and, and I want to put two questions to you, if I can. Um, they're, they're linked. The, you, you ended your remarks by bringing us up to the present day and um, expressing some hopes and also some concerns about, about where we are right now as a country. Um, I was just curious to see if you had thoughts about, do you think that being uh, more aware of this story about the role of the automobile in the, in the earlier civil rights movement and also the role that it had in the lives of African-Americans, does that help us to contextualize better what's going on now? Does it does it give us a better purchase on understanding um, the, the the present day? You know, I think I think it helps us to understand <clears throat> somewhat the re the relationship between the police and African Americans, and the relationship between the police and people of color. I think it helps us, you know, to think about this idea that we as a society have given power to the police to do something that we would not allow them to do in our homes. So if you had a, a cracked piece of glass in your home or you had um, you know, a, a light out on your front porch, you could, you, the police could not come into your home, invade your home. But if you have a light out over your license plate or you have a cracked windshield or you have just um, a, too much tint, or the, if the police think you have too much tint um, in your windows, they can stop you. So we have empowered the police to stop people for very minor, very minor offenses, some of which are not even offenses, and to kill them <laughs> for, you know, to give out the death penalty for, you know, um, what was the last one that he was stopped for something that was very minor that he should have gotten a ticket for and he was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I think as a society, we really need to think about that, that we have empowered the police in ways that, and the, and the Supreme Court has said, yes, it's okay that we should feel um, safer. But w the police have been told that what they are doing is fighting the war on drugs and fighting the war on crime. The data shows that that's not what they're doing at all because less than 10% of these traffic stops that they make because they think they're fighting the war on crime and the war on drugs, less than 10% result in any contraband whatsoever or in any arrest whatsoever. So they are not fighting this war they think they're fighting. It's not effective. These traffic stops are not effective and we need the police to do their job fighting crime, but not by making um, random traffic stops. 
That is not an effective crime fighting technique. And we need to find other ways of dealing with people with mental illness, people who are d domestic disturbances. I mean, I think there are other agencies <clears throat> that we can collaborate with. Um, and do we really need to send someone with a gun to address traffic stops? So, so for example, we can digitally, we can deal with people who are speeders. We can deal with people who run stop signs, you know, digitally, we can, we can have them cited, given citations um, by people who don't wear guns, by a traffic enforcement squad rather than a um, crime fighting squad. The police don't seem to see the difference between minor infractions and major infractions. And that, it, you know, a light out over your license plate is not a reason to um, search your car mm. or get you out of your car or kill you. So this last question it comes from me and, and it, it's a conversation that I've had um, at times with my students. Um, I, I wanna take advantage of the fact that I think you and I basically are in the same generation. Um, but one of the things that that um, you'll you'll hear from students who are very, very concerned with what they see going on around them and are very worried is a sense that the country's going backwards in some fundamental way, that 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 we're actually headed in the wrong direction. And I just wanted to get your take as a as a historian, as someone who's worked on this book, as someone that has the experience that you have to look at the back up and look at this in a bigger way and say you know is king right is does the does, does the arc of the moral universe really bend toward justice um you know uh -huh. only if we bend it that way <laughs> okay fair enough so yeah how would you how would you sort of think about that big picture and i think that's probably a good place for us to end on i think the 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 thing that keeps me going is thinking about the fact that, and I think Barack Obama said this uh, as well as, as using that quote about the Marco III or, uh, uh, moral universe, that progress never has happened in a straight line. You know, mm -hmm. it's always one step forward, two steps back, one step forward, step forward. And I think we had made progress and now we're in that reactionary period, right? When people are pushing back against that progress. They're pushing back against gay marriage. They're pushi pushing back against African-American civil rights. They're, push you know, they're pushing back against all these liberal, quote unquote, liberal ideas that they think are um, new. And um, you know, they, they don't want gay people to be able to buy wedding cakes and wedding dresses and have weddings and all of these things that they see as um, negative and immoral. Um, and I, I just think we're in a reactionary time. So, mm. um, but I have hope that, I mean, look, um, our governor in, in New York state has forced all of the police departments to come up with a plan for returning to community policing. I mean, there, there are actually places around the United States um, Berkeley, California, now I realize these are all pretty left-wing places, but Berkeley, California is eliminating um, traffic stops by policemen with guns. All the traffic stops are going to be made either digitally by some sort of electronic device that checks your speeding as you go under it, or um, they will be stopped by a traffic enforcement squad rather than um, police with, with weapons drawn. Um, you know, so there are places where things are experimental, that people are experimenting with new ideas. Um, <clears throat> there are actually a few policemen that contacted me and said they would like to use the, the video, the documentary for training. Oh. Yeah. So I think, you know, there, we, can, we can see small amounts of progress. I do get frustrated when I see this kind of continued um, murder of, of black men or this discrimination against people who are gay 
um, or, you know, I, it, it is frustrating, but I, I remind myself that, you know, it's never, progress is never in a straight line. Um, I think it's terrific that there are so many allies and um, collaborators with black people going into the streets and saying, yes, black lives do matter. Um, I think that's really um, important. And I'm glad to live in New York state as opposed to some of the other states <laughs> in the United States. I have, I do have to say that. <laughs> well, we will, we will leave it on that note of boosterism for New York, but also on that more generally more hopeful note. And uh, again, I wanna thank everybody um, for tuning in and for the questions that you submitted. But of course, my biggest thanks is to Professor Soren uh, Gretchen. This was just uh, a really interesting, marvelous talk. It's a great book. I really do highly recommend it. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, a wonderful documentary that, that you and Rick Burns made uh, based on it. So thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. We've got a lot of people that have just been wanting to express their appreciation to you. So I'm, oh, I'm doing, you. It, doing it on behalf of all of them. The awkward part of these Zoom things is the way that they end. So I, know. Um, I am concluding the program at this time. And I will say to everyone, we will see you down the road. And don't forget, um, two weeks from now, we have our last day of democracy lecture. But again, thanks, Gretchen. I, it, was, it was really wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Virtually. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>